Right. Okay. Uh, welcome to Raptorade, Everton Miranda. Uh, you're we're speaking to you. You're in Brazil, aren't you, at the moment? Yes. Yes, I'm in Brazil, in Mato Grosso. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Um, thank so you for the invitation. The, the gist of it is they're always, dead, as, I, as I think I said to you, they're always dead relaxed. So it was just a case of I wanted to get you on um, to talk to you about the, the fantastic work that you do with, with Harpy Eagles in, in Brazil. Um, so it's really the, the floor sort of yours to, to talk about the work. Now, I obviously, I think as I mentioned to you, I came across you. Uh, reading the Natural Geographic, National Geographic, sorry, um, interview that, that came out sometime the beginning of April. So, yeah, I, I read that. Um, and so, yeah, start start from the beginning. You're a bit biologist based in Brazil. Go on, start, carry on. So I was a biologist uh, raised in southeastern Brazil. That is the most developed part of the country, near by the coast. Okay. I have been always interested in big predators, as you may remember from the, the National Geographic piece. I have a, a past on fighting sports, so I like fighting a lot. I have a kind of a pleasure on, on blood and violence. <laughs> and I started to study top predators as soon as I graduated. So I did my master's on anacondas. I studied at anacondas for two years. And I was about to go or for Jaguars or for Harp Eagles in the PhD. But the thing was that there is a lot of, of good people studying Jaguars in South America, like perhaps 100, 110 very good researchers working on Jaguars. And I didn't saw that much space to grow as a researcher on Jaguar compared to harp eagles and then I started to do something on harp eagles and the thing was that I was not let's say so interested in making a meaningful impact on conservation but a funding agency from from UK called Ruffer you probably know it yeah told me well you're asking us for for that money and you're telling us about a lot of interesting stuff regarding conservation, but how, how do you transform the reality, right? How do you transform the problems you're, you're dealing with? Yeah. And then I came with the tourism thing. That was kind of an adventure in the, in the beginning, but it worked perfectly. And that's kind of what is happening nowadays. We are surfing that way. That functioned well. Yeah. Yeah, so so obviously, just to keep, yeah, I, I, anyone who hasn't read the article on National Geographic, I'll I'll put a link up onto onto in the comments or something underneath this. So yeah, you had it was it was quite an interesting background, really. You 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 were big into your mixed martial arts. I think do I remember you got into martial arts at twelve years old or something like that, and yes. then you did your pro, you know you went professional with it and and you did some illegal, well, well sort of yeah. you know sort of yeah legal sort of fighting with it as well and then what i can't remember reading it in the article what was the bit where you thought well actually i want to you know i want to feed my my desire for blood and violence and jump to predators what what was it your parents or was it just well i need to grow up sort of moment in your life or i don't know what it was actually uh understanding that there was something unethical about punching another human being in the face for the for the fun of a third human being yeah and on nature it, i found a kind of violence that's not wrong that has no no moral grounds right predation has no moral grounds yeah yeah and then i found a, a kind of blood a kind of violence that i could could like without uh, having any any moral compass on it yeah. And then it, it was just fun. It is just fun up to, up to nowadays. It's the, the best job on earth, for real. Right. Yeah, every, every time I have 20,000 camera trap photos of a harp eagle nest to, to check, I'm really happy with my, my job. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I, I can imagine, I can tell you this now, and I'm not a, I'm not in, in, a violent person at all, but I'd rather look at 20,000 images of a harp eagle than get punched in the face. That would be sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> well, that's just what I'm into. Um, so, you obviously, yeah, the, touching on anacondas, so you, you obviously you did your master's in anacondas, and I remember reading a really interesting bit about how you set yourself the challenge of, finding 200 anacondas was it in 45 days is that yeah. right yes and yeah, everyone thought that. you were bonkers I, I mean for someone who knows nothing about reptiles really i'm, I'm birds of prey mad, mad. How, how easy is it to find an anaconda in in the rainforest it's a nearly impossible thing like oh. finding that many on, on such a short time but i it was not an effort, a, a macho effort of doing everything by myself and finding that many. I ac actually partnered with a management team in Northern Argentina. Mm -hmm. And with them, I was able to find a very large number of individuals. It seems that I froze. Oh, sorry, I froze I'm yeah, you're right. you can't, yeah, carry on, we've got you. Yeah. Okay, so I partnered with that team, with that management team, and I eventually was able to find that many individuals in such a, a so short time span. Yeah. And it was done during the winter, everything was done in a way to maximize my chances of finding anacondas, so it worked very well. And that was like, my main thing, working with the yellow anacondas, and besides them, I'm trying to create a formal project on green anacondas in the Amazon. That seems to 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 happen in 2021. I may be with another with another project in 2021 with green anacondas again. But that that is the reason why my first sampling worked so well. I was partnering with the right people in the right timing and so on. Yeah. Okay. So that. I mean, I, yeah, I couldn't, off the back of this then, how do you, you obviously enjoy the the, the environment of the rainforest, which is, you know, I, I've only spent a, a, a few weeks in, in rainforests and um, yeah, I I, um, I can imagine that it's, well, it's it's hard work, full stop. So what do, 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 do you find it a, a chore or a, a, a just part you've just got to get on with it or how do you feel you know in swamps and you know finding trying to find a, a snake or a harp eagle in the rainforest well it's interesting because i'm i'm actually a guy that favors more open spaces i prefer yeah. wetlands and savannas than than forests the forest is a bit close to claustrophobic for me yeah, but I came to the arc of the first station in the Amazon forest a couple of years ago, and I was absolutely traumatized by it. I could not live without doing something for that region, and then I came to work here. But the forest is not the let's say the most comfy environment for me. Yeah, it's too dark, too closed. Climbing is not my thing either. I learned it because I need to, but it, yeah. I, I fucking hate, hates, like I'm fully afraid of it, but I do it because it's my work nowadays. Yeah. But I'm more a guy, a savanna guy, a wetland guy. I prefer <laughs> more more open spaces. Whereas the forest is beautiful. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is. And, but I hear that you, you, you if you, I, you follow anyone who works in the rainforest they, and, and those sort of environments, they all say the same thing that it's hideous. And I remember, years ago um, when the peregrine fund used to put out when they started their panama harp eagle project, and they were going to do hack sites and actually you used to be able to apply to go and work on it and i remember applying myself to go on it um and a friend of mine put me off and he said do not in, in, he says do not go and spend six months in the rainforest he'd spent a lot of time out there and he was like it will be your worst nightmare it's and, and that was it i said i said no uh, and i kind of wish i'd done it now if, if i'd have had the opportunity you, quit it? you never, I, never I didn't know I, I i didn't i didn't follow it up so uh but i kind of wish i did now but anyway such is such is <laughs> life it's so you're because i never got there because i think i was too young when it was actually happening 
things that I end up publishing part of the data with them. Oh, brilliant. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. So yes. obviously you're now on, you, you switch from snakes to, to, um, to harpy eagles. Um, how long have you been working on harpy eagles for now then? Uh, four years. And notice that I don't consider myself a specialist, neither on snakes or on harpy eagles. I understand yeah. predation a bit as an ecologist. But I need to be really close to ornithologists and falconeers and herpetologists in the case of anacondas to do my job. So it's no, no act of arrogance that I think that I am a specialist in all groups. It's not the case. Yeah. I just understood the methods and I'm close to people who understand those species really well. So it's the, so it is, it's the predatory aspect of it that, that attracts you yes. to it, not necessarily the the individual species but i suppose you, you, you like anything you have to have a, a fondness of of the individual species that you that you're monitoring or working on um so so harp eagles then how i mean i'm someone who in in the uk here i'm i'm fortunate enough i spend a lot of time monitoring nests when when we haven't got a pandemic stopping us from going out um, and I love it. I love nest finding. Um, I've been fortunate enough to spend some time in the Philippines um, and, and we, I've been to a Philippine eagle nest. And I have to admit, one of my first remarks was, how on earth have you found this nest? Because it was, in the mid I mean, it was, and a lot of it, a lot of the forest had been cleared. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't dense primary forest. But yeah, so how do you find a, a, an eagle nest in a rainforest? It just baffles me, and I spend a lot of time looking for nests. Oh, they are actually nearly impossible, impossible, impossible to find. Nearly impossible to find. When I when I made my sampling design before starting the project, my plan was to find them one by myself because I was perhaps overconfident after my success with the anacondas during my master. And that was the most I, stupid idea I ever had in my life. And the thing is that I started walking, doing line transects on the forest. And I would stop every, every 100 meters, maybe, and do a harp eagle playback, check the emergent trees with the binoculars, and see if I found a nest. And when I walked, I think 42 kilometers, I found the first one, like it was 50 meters from a road, a logging road. Yeah. It was amazing, perhaps one of the best experiences of my life, like going there and I was like, that looks like a harp eagle nest. And I got under under the nest and there was a, a slot jaw. That's a, a very good indication that is actually harp eagle nest in there. And I just made the map. I was like, well, I can walk perhaps 80 kilometers a month, and I will find the two nests every month, and I will find a shitload of nests. And then I started walking everywhere a lot. I walked, I made it perhaps a little more than 400 kilometers of, of line transects and didn't find anything else, like zero, zero point zero 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 zero. I found three harpy eagles, no nests at all. Yeah. And I realized that this was not going to work. And I decided to partnership with people that's doing line transects in the forest all the time, so that are the Brazil nut collectors. They work on the bush all the time. And the main tree for harpy eagles to do their nests here, specifically in Southern Amazonia, is on Brazil nut trees. It's the main okay main breeding species and then they, they i offered them a, a monetary reward for each nest they found and i started to to work in partnership with them which worked perfectly and they have been finding nests science to this time so by nowadays i think 90 95 percent of the nests we have have been found by brazil nut collectors yeah, well, exactly. It, it, it's exactly the same with the with the Philippine eagle nest that was found by one of the one of the um, locals who was uh, working on his banana plantation. 
Um, so, it's exa- so you're now working with Brazil, Brazil nut harvesters, people in the in the forests that are, and 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 funding. Obviously, there's a monetary incentive for them to to find find a nest. D- going back to the nest that you found, because when you smiled when you said you were over the moon i mean i've been there i still get that excitement when i find a, a nest of a species like you know i find but it's interesting i i can also relate to the walking thing because one of the species that i i monitor in the uk is the goshawk which is a forest bird nowhere near on the scale that that you're you're monitoring uh or the, the the amazon the area you're covering but i remember the first time i started monitoring them i did the same as you and i used to just walk around walk around and then a, a, a some robin a friend of mine who's got many many years experience la- laughed at me and he had a saying for it he used to say you you've either got um got you either have golden boots or cauliflower arse and basically golden boots is these young kids who want to just yomp around everywhere and look and oh i'll find it and the cauliflower arse is just to sit outside the the the, the forest and watch for the birds displaying and then they'll they'll show you roughly where they are and then you go in and yeah so so yeah i learned quite quickly that i needed more of a cauliflower arse than golden boots um with that do you think that that nest that you found do you think that was um, luck then, or was it just pure luck? Pure luck. Yeah. It was nearby roads, and it's a fucking huge structure. Yeah, a, a tree had felt between myself and the nest recently, so it made just the perfect window, and the chick was just in the right age to answer very des- desperately for uh, adult playback. Just the, the the days before they they fledge, yeah. where they are really responsive to to playback, so that was it, right? Yeah. Well, you, I, I mean, you back the animal answer it. <laughs> I got the binoculars on the on the right spot, got there and found it, and it was a beautiful nest. It is until now. This is a, one of the most beautiful nests we have, one of the tallest trees, most beautiful ones. But the thing is that you cannot do that by yourself. And everyone uh, gave me an advice against it, telling me, oh, don't, don't offer people rewards for finding nests. Yeah. Because that will generate problems. One of them was snail ratting, that I bet you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he told me two, two stories about it. Not him personally, but... Eduardo Alvarez Cordeiro from Venezuela told me two stories from him working with that kind of, of methods. The first of them was that he offered a reward, a very small reward for people to, to find nests for him in Guiana, in Northern South America. Mm-hmm. And people started fighting over nests because sometimes it was an indigenous community where more than one generation knew the same nest and the, the ownership was kind of blur. The ownership of it was kind of blur and yeah. people started fighting and started to write the, the, the names on on the hard eagle nest trees and so on. And, start to threaten the, the, the eagles because they were not getting a reward and someone else was and so on. And Neil also has a story of the kind that he came uh, in indigenous communities in the Philippines for yeah. the Philippine eagle. And he told people, oh, I need nests with eggs from that eagle species and so on. And I don't know how much of that is a uh, is folklore or this the actual story yeah but the thing is that neil came back a couple months later and people had philippine eagle eggs philippine eagle nests philippine eagle feathers all on their homes to show to the erratic like they did, didn't they did found the nest broke it home and tried to sell it to, to the erratic later don't know how much of truth that story is but the thing is that I was very careful here from the beginning to establish very clear rules regarding the Brazilian collectors about how I would pay them, how I would pay the landowner, 
and how they could get compensated fairly for it in case more than one person found an ass and so on. And for me here, I never have had problems regarding that kind of subject. I always have been able to share the reward between more than one person yeah. and to offer the, the landowner a compensation or something like that. So it's working well for me. Oh, brilliant. Okay. And do, do you think that's partly because because you've obviously linked up with um, organize, the organizations that, that manage the Brazil nut collecting or how, how does that work? Is it, is, is it an organization that buys the nuts and dispenses them or? Normally they have little associations and cooperatives that go collecting nuts in the, in the forest. And what's, what happens usually is that uh, I go to the storage place they have. They normally have a big space to put the nuts while they are waiting to sell it. Yeah. And it puts post posters on it. And those posters explain how much a nest is worth and why I need it. I explain that's not for capturing the eagles, that I install cameras on the nests. It has the number of my permit. I, it's everything right in there. I'm a researcher. I need to do that because of those reasons. Here is my WhatsApp number. Here is my Facebook. Here is my email. If you know anything, please contact me. And I also go to, to same associations and cooperatives and give them small lectures about harp eagles and my work and the tourism. Yeah. And they end up learning a bit and they actually enjoy it a lot because besides the reward I pay them, we also hire them to help us when we are doing tourism. Yeah. So they help us transporting the towers and managing the trails and cleaning the trails and doing that kind of, of work. So how, as the, the Brazil nut collection job is seasonal, they have something else to work with and yeah. the other timings of the year. No, bro. Excellent. So with the, 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 all the kilometers that you covered, um, back when you you were wandering about the forest tr trying to find find nests have you have you found any nests in any of the sites where you've walked through and you just didn't didn't see them have you covered that again or a brazil nut the brazil nut workers have they found any nests and you've gone oh i walked i was i was within a kilometer of that when i was doing my transects yeah in the same property i found the first nest they found a second one that was like 60 meters from a road, I pass it by like two or three times and I could never see it, yeah. but they ju just go under each nest collecting nets. And this one was one of them. All uh, right, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, it's work. It's working now. In, you, obviously, <clears throat> I, I don't, we can't, we can't talk about the Amazon and, and you mentioned logging roads and, and talk about um, and not talk about deforestation. So the, that's the biggest threat to harpy eagles, I presume. Yes, the they are well. yeah. Both are highly problematic in the region I live. That's not the case all over the Amazon, but here where I live, we have a big problem with deforestation on the arc of deforestation, on the southern, southeastern, and eastern portion of the Amazon forest. So this is being incinerated outside in, mainly for cattle ranching. And that's a big problem. The thing is that in Brazil, our environmental law is pretty strong. And when you have a property in the Amazon forest specifically, you can only fell 20% of it and you must keep the river borders and the sections of it that has more than 45 degrees of inclination and how much of a river border you must keep depends on the river side size right bigger river bigger forest you you must keep on that keep yeah and the problem is that there is no compensation for someone who occupies the land with cattle ranching to keep those 80% of force there, right? Yeah. Essentially, they want to break the law because it's a, a, a financially sterile place for them. 
And with the tourism, I can offer an option yeah, to an option, make the yeah. portion of, of forest profitable, right? Yeah. But the main problem on our region is for sure deforestation. And we are on a, on a 10 year record now for forest loss. On the current year, we are on a 10 year high. And what, what's, what's behind that high? Because <clears throat> again, coming from, um, the, based in the UK, you know, we, we depend on, or I depend on uh, the news. And obviously in the world we live in now, there's a lot of fake news. Bol Bolsonaro, the president, it comes under a lot of flack on or certainly reading about reading about him in the press. There's never really a good article when it comes about Bolsonaro in the environment when they're when they're, they're in the same story. So is it is it the set is it all doom and gloom in that sense with Bolsonaro in charge? Think, but let, yes. So the press in Brazil will show we are very political on this discussion. As soon as he assumed, I think I froze. Yeah, you I'm did. I think I think it's because I started talking about politics and I didn't like it. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to get too political, but no, the thing is that uh, Brazil is on a current economic crisis that started on 2014, exactly because of the drop on the prices of the commodities we sell, right? As for instance, soybean, meat, wood, and so on. And as soon as Bolsonaro reached the power, he cuts the funds uh, for forest caring institutions by 50%. And he also has a very good relationship with the mining sector of Brazil, besides the productive sector. So the prestation increased a lot. First, because you have less uh, law enforcement lately. Yeah. And second, because you have a, a rise on the meat prices induced by China. So you have two processes working together to increase the frustration. And the thing, Jimmy, uh, one thing that I like to make for Agnes to understand is that Brazil has like 100 million people that make less than, than $100 per month, right? Yeah. The Amazon forest will be integrated to our economy no matter what. Don't, don't have any illusions that the future is different from that, right? The thing is that it can be integrated to, to Brazil's economy through sportive fishing, sustainable logging, tourism, and bioprospection of pharmaceutical products and so on or it can be integrated through cattle ranching, right? The second scenario is not, not the one I want. Yeah. So yeah. what we are eventually trying to do is to make that integration in a smart way. Yeah. Yeah, no, I complete. I can completely understand, understand that. Having seen it in, the, again, in going back to time in the Philippines, it's about, it's all about finding, finding a balance really. Um, in favor of the environment because it's it's not a finite resource so so yeah i can i completely understand where what you mean by that um i've got a couple i've got a couple someone's asked a question we'll go back to harp eagles and this question will will out because that's what we really want to talk about there's someone's asked how many birds are still left in the wild but i think reading the article you, there's no definitive figure is there on on no 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 because few people have published the uh, densities uh, one, <laughs> one not so great trait of harp eagle researchers is that they're not publication prone. So a lot of people have many nests and didn't publish uh, many data about them. So we have a single published density from Panama that's made by Jesus, you may know him. He works for the Peregrine Fund. He made a very good job on calculating the density on Panama 
yeah. especially for indigenous reserves and so on. And we suppose it varies between three and six nests per 100 square, square kilometers. I suppose it's kind of the same in the Amazon forest and elsewhere in South America that we vary between two, two, two points of three, six nests between uh, each 100 square kilometers, but we don't have any estimates for the whole for the whole Amazon forest or for what remains. Mm -hmm. What we know is that 93% of the current range is on the Amazon forest. And the 7% remaining are the population of pockets in Central America and in the Atlantic forest. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so so essentially the Amazon rainforest is is critical for the survival of this this species. But again, in like in the in the National Geographic article, um, uh, it hits the nail on the head, saying if you protect the harpy eagle, you are going to protect a whole host of other species and and and, and the well, yeah, the. the the whole of the Amazon, essentially. If you look after the predators, then then it you know it cascades down through the through the rest of the species. So it's yeah, it's important work. Yes, and um, we also protect the, the mega trees that they depend on nesting, the the prey species, and so on. So it's a very interesting species to work from the point of view of tourism that can deliver a lot in terms of conservation. Uh, it's a, a truly umbrella species, and it's, it's much easier to see than a jaguar or an anaconda. So, yeah. So we'll well we'll come on. I, I will. I'll, we'll come on to tourism towards towards the end. I, let, I just want to find out a bit more about harp eagles. Obviously, you've you've been to a nest. The, the picture that you on your Facebook post that you did earlier, the picture you put up is. I have to admit. A, I, I climb trees. I, I do all rope climbing, and I don't mind it too much. I'm 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 not too bad at it. Consider I'm a bit of a fat lad, but I'm you know I get I can get up a tree. Is that you up the tr up in the photo? Yeah, it's me. Uh, Unfortunately, it's me. That because that's an epic photo though. That is that is an <laughs> epic photo. Um, so how high up that? What what sort of that's in a Brazil nut tree? Is it? It's a Brazilian tree, and that one specifically is 35 meters on the first fork, on the first bifurcation. Okay. And the average, <coughs> the average here is 33 meters. That's a 10 store beauty. Yeah, it's to anyone who doesn't understand, that's high. That's very high. <laughs> that's very high. Very right. hard to survive if you make a mistake up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to make a mistake up there. <laughs> Absolutely. And so you're up. You're up at the nest. Obviously, these nests are used for for several years. What's the? Obviously, you've been monitoring harp eagles for four years. Are there any? Have you got any records of nests that have been used year after year after year, going past four years? Yes, they actually use the same nests for decades in a row. Mm -hmm. uh, we are aware that the harp eagles can live 50, 70 years in captivity. We suppose that they live kind of 35 years in the wild. Mm -hmm. And they nest on the same tree unless something bad happens, like uh, a lightning or, don't know, African yeah. bees colonize the tree, that kind of stuff. Otherwise, they stay on the same nest tree. We had a nest here in, in my state, in Mato Grosso state, that had a nest from, from 94 to 2015. Wow. In a single tree. And people told me, I'm not sure about that, but people told me, reliable people told me, that the nest that Nayorati studied in Guiana in the 60s, is it still active up to wow. nowadays? Yes. Wow, that's fascinating. That's awesome. Brilliant. That, that um, would be a cool place to, to, to visit. Yeah, absolutely. That is, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, in terms of obviously 
the adult birds you're, you're going up and what what's the purpose of putting cam because you put cameras on on the nest what's the what's the main or what are the purposes of putting the cameras on the nest for people who, who've never experienced this sort of thing before my main purpose with the cameras is to describe the feeding habits and how does it get impacted by logging and habitat loss right so depending on how much pasture or logging you have around the nest, I can understand how, how lesser they are feeding, how less biomass they consume, and how the species composition changes. Tools are my basic interests, and I start camera trapping as for two regions, but we end up learning much more than we suppose them. As for instance, I can do activity patterns activity pattern uh, estimations to tell the tourists where is the exact time they should show up in a tower to see the harapigus, for instance, to maximize the chances of seeing one. Uh, of course, yeah, yeah, with the with the tourism, yeah. So what sort of, because because harpy eagles, um, anyone who's who's read about them or looked at them on, on YouTube or somewhere like that, they're sort of synonymous with the um, sloth and, and you know there's a very well known well a, a YouTube video of one grabbing a sloth on what sort of prey what sort of prey are they are they feeding on in, in your area what what makes up a large part of their diet before I started that do you know where this is lot grabbing video came from no don't tell me it's made up I don't know go on <laughs> it's made up but it's from a time it's from a time it was okay to make stuff up. Right, okay, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> okay, well, ignore that. You've, you've shattered many people's illusions of harpy eagles. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it does, it does happen. So, <laughs> what, what sort of things are they, are they bringing into the nest then? Uh, but got? sorry, let, let me finish the story of the, of this lot. It's a cool one. Oh God. But, neurotic, but there's a lot there to see the harpy eagle grab in it, and he personal. Know personally filmed it and he described it he describes how he did so in the first harp eagle paper published wow it's like one of the last few paragraphs in the in the whole paper go to check on it and he calculated the, the speed of the harp eagle to to go grab it and so on and actually you remasterized the, the video like 200 times <laughs> and nowadays and that's the story of the single video we have of a hard eagle catching prey. So speaking about slots, on my study site, as I am in Southern Amazonia, we have like three months of a dry season here. Yeah. And we don't have such a, uh, let's say, constant rainfall on two months and constant air humidity. So I don't have here two pillowed slots. Oh, sorry, I don't have three toad slots here. I have two toad, and they are not as much abundant as they are in central Amazonia. So they are still the main prey, but not so common as elsewhere. I would say the normal thing is that 50% of heart eagle diet is just slot. And here is like a third, maybe. Okay. Like 30% of the total diet is slot. And then we have all kinds of our prey, captain monkeys, lesser and theater, uh, woolly monkeys, coatis, iguanas, curassows, and so on. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, fantastic. So, what I mean, I'm interested to know this actually. What if you can sort of encapsulate it into a, a paragraph what are you finding with with diets and deforestation what what are the sort of standout things that are, are sort of showing up to you already well i didn't made any formal analysis of that subject yet but the thing seems to be uh let's say a bit idiosyncratic like each pair of eagles is taking a kind of different solution to deal with deforestation and, and logging. The thing you observe with logging, the most common thing to observe with logging is that they start to eat a lot of lesser and theater because logging leaves a lot of wood debris inside the forest. 
that end up having a lot of termites that okay, end yeah. up feeding a lot of lesser armor, lesser anteater and the harpy goes eat a lot of them. That's the, okay. the case with logged sites, essentially. And on the graded places, on places that have been degraded by, by cattle ranching, that's clear cut of the forest, you see an increase of less requiring species. For instance, capturing monkeys that you can find eventually everywhere. And some places they would take a shitload of birds like macaws. Mm -hmm. Macaws do very well on, on the graded sites also. They are good on feeding on the remaining pounds that stay on the on the on the cattle ran cattle ranches. Yeah. So they eat a lot of macaws on that kind of site. And some individuals and tools are the ones that are performing better. They learn how to hunt armadillos on the fields. And those individuals, they just go well with the first station. But it doesn't happen every time, unfortunately. But the yeah. ones that can adapt to feed on armadillos, they just go perfect. They eat a shitload of them. They bring like four armadillos at once to the nest. Right. The chicks are extremely fat and they, they keep doing well. Oh, wow. So, cause, and that's what it's all about. It's adaptability, isn't it? The, the eagles are just uh, adapting yes. to whether it's anteaters, like you say, who've moved in to feed on termites, macaws or uh, armadillos. Wow. I, I mean, I I need to see some of these pictures that you're getting on camera traps because it sounds... <laughs> it's, it looks, it sounds well, follow amazing. me on Instagram. I promise yeah, to get them there. Yeah, definitely, because it sounds absolutely brilliant. Okay, <clears throat> someone's asked another question, which I knew would come along at some point. Um, I've got a friend who, who we had on here, actually, James Aldred, who's a wildlife cameraman. And he's he had a very famous encounter with a harp eagle. They put a camera on a nest and he got attacked by the female um, and she nearly knocked him out. Uh, well, I think he, he, she essentially did at one point. Have you, Someone's just asked, how close have you been to being attacked by a harp eagle? I have been attacked like once and they yeah. tried to scare me and they succeeded on doing so on two occasions uh, and all of them were, were the death that was out of stupidity because we could not we could not observe that the nest had a, a small chick so and we could not climb a, a nearby tree to observe it and we could see nothing with the binoculars we had to go up to take a look at it yeah and on that specific occasion i was going up right and i saw the eagle she was vocalizing a lot she was obviously pissed off with me and she changed it from the nest tree to a tree that was a bit taller and could offer her a leverage point towards me right yeah. very typical heavy hatter attitude and i kept an eye for her and she was really interested on me while I was with my back towards her. That's exactly what James said. Yes, she was really, really interested on my back. And I was spinning on the rope. I was far from the, from the other side of the rope and I was spinning a bit and going up. And I was so focused on her that I didn't notice that the, the nest had a, a small young inside. I was just looking at her all the time. Yeah. And I was spinning and I saw with the corner of my eye, she dropping from the branch. Like the, it, that's the fucking scariest thing to happen to you. Because I was spinning and I just saw her dropping, just saw her dropping. Like that thing of a giant hat or just jumping yeah. in the air and opening the wings. And I was like, she's coming for, for me right now. And I had the, the very good idea of wrapping my legs on the other side of the rope and coming towards her facing her on like the last split second of it yeah. and she changed directions like in the in the last two meters maybe yeah. before before reaching me yeah. and that 
obviously scared me. I actually was able on that right point to look at the nest and see the small young. And I was like, okay, I'm going out. And then I got down and that was it for that day. And on two other occasions, the, the young was already fledged. So they're not really aggressive on that, yeah. that point. And they just came to inspect me. Normally with the with prey on the on the feet, they just came to take a look. See what you're up to. I kind of part of me having having just chatted to you now um, and and knowing about your background before before you go into harpy eagles. Part of me thought you probably like getting beaten up by a harpy eagle. You'd actually this this was your this was your sort of thing. You've gone from having fights with humans to fights with massive eagles, which is <laughs> right right up your street. But I can imagine it's absolutely terrifying. But it's interesting. James James said exactly the same thing. Whenever his back was turned that's when she and she knew she'd watch him and as soon as he turned on the ropes she was yeah she was coming in so is there a is there a it's when them they're most aggressive it makes sense then when they've got some very small chicks up to what sort of age do you think or possibly so very small chicks to to the age that the youngest fledged right. that's when they are the most aggressive and the eggs and I yeah. don't recommend anyone to try to climb a nest with eggs. It's bad for the eagles, it's bad for you. Yeah. Same thing for small chicks, for chicks that have less than 15 days. I would not recommend anyone to do that. Yeah. If you have a very good reason, you may go there to don't know weigh the chick and do that kind of stuff. But I really don't don't recommend that kind of too invasive research. Well, I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't think there's anyone watching this that's probably thinking I'm going to do, do it anyway. I think we're quite safe for the knowledge that... Don't, that, don't, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I, I wouldn't mind doing it, but I'll be wearing a, I'll be wearing a crash helmet, that's, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> you know, about, but, uh, about wearing, wearing helmets, uh, Shane McPherson, you may know him. He's done yeah, with the, the cr crown Eagles, Eagles, yeah. in South yeah. Africa for, for many years. Did an amazing work there. He painted eyes on his helmet to avoid being attacked. Very clever. Good idea. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. good idea. All right. So obviously, yeah, you, you're going up and you, you're putting these, these cameras on the nests. So just again for people who just don't know much about harp eagles, I'm conscious that we've been talking for a long time. Um, how long are the ch how long are the chicks in the nest for or the young in the nest for how, how long's the breeding season for a harp eagle that, that'd be an easy question. well as far as we know they are not seasonal but the young remains on the nest all the time being an unfledged chick for up to five seven months and from then on you have more 30 36 months until the young disperses from 20 months are, are ahead, they will not be around the nest tree. They will be fed elsewhere. There will be already a, a bit of dispersion. And with 30, 36 months, they will be gone and then the, the couple will start a new breeding cycle. So it's kind of three years, let's say. Yeah. I seem to, I seem to remember there was a paper that came out on harpy eagles. You correct me if I'm wrong about where the adult birds when they've got a youngster obviously they only have one chick um they they hunt further away from the nest with the with the and the, i think the theory or the the idea was that the surrounding area of the nest was left the prey species were left for when the eagle fledged and started hunting for itself it, is that right i haven't made that up have i well that, that's the a hypothesis that a lot of people defend, but there is no evidence in favor of it. Right, but it, okay. there is a lot of people who understand a lot about harp eagles and people who I respect, like Eduardo Alvarez Cordeiro, who yeah. say that uh, they hunt in a kind of donut shape around the nest and preserve preserve a bit of prey nearby the nest to allow the young to, to learn hunting. Yeah, I don't know how we could test that to be kind of impossible to make a very nice test of it but a lot of people defend that hypothesis i suppose the only way you could possibly do it is by 
um, is GPS tagging is if you had two adults that would GPS tag so you could understand, you know, the distance that they were. And and I was going to ask you actually, is is there anywhere anyone that's doing any studies GPS tagging harpy eagles? Not really. I don't know if the GPS could solve it for harpy eagles. You would need a really high frequency GPS for having that to work, like one one heifer every fifteen minutes. I think it's not impossible, but it's not easy. And yeah. you would need a shitload of, of adults equipped with telemetry devices. I would say 15, 20 adults and finding 15, 20 harp eagles is not easy. Yeah. And no one has managed to develop uh, useful, replicable, cheap technique to trap the adults. So yeah. there is no one working on telemetry on them. What we have regarding space use and GPS tagging and so on is with fledged eagles, right? So people got into the nest, put telemetry devices on the unfledged chick, the chick fledged. It takes, don't know, one year, one year and a half to start to disperse. Yeah. And then the telemetry device is not working anymore. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my my colleagues on heart eagle research will be pissed off with me, but you learn nothing. You yeah. learn zero, essentially yeah, yeah. zero. Yeah, and I... you have program fund data. They yeah. introduced forty nine individuals in Panama. They have a shitload of telemetry data about those individuals. A lot of it is, is GPS telemetry, mm -hmm. but they didn't publish that yet. And you need a really good data cruncher to dive into that amazing set of data to make a synthesis and yeah. allow, allow us to understand. That may be a bit better than the usual telemetry data about harp eagles because it refers to it refers to individuals that are a bit older and in some cases they are adults so it allows us to learn a bit but no one has ever telemetered adult harp eagles that actually have a roam range have a breeding yeah. territory have a nest and so on no one has ever done that no okay fair enough someone's just asked a question and i i've, I've lost it now because it's scrolled down but i i got the gist of it and it was something i was going to ask as well we've talked about deforestation someone's asked whether there was a co is there ever a conflict between harp eagles predating livestock i.e chickens um and i and i i'm one of the things that i'm always really interested in is the human bird of prey conflict aspect of, of any any species so is is there much conflict chicken eating well there is it's not a lot it's more of a let's say a tail that the, this is a raptor that eats livestock and regarding the chickens they are the lesser of my problems they also eat pigs they eat dogs they eat small goats small sheep so yeah. it's not it's not the usual raptor they do shit that uh, i i'm not happy with yeah but less than 20 percent of the birds that have been shot were actually involved in livestock predation most yeah. of them were not and people were just like so oh, this is a raptor it's a very large one. I don't know what it is. And they kill it to, we have an expression in Portuguese that we say, see with the hands when you want to experience something by touching it. Touch, yeah. It's a, a very usual feeling for someone to kill a harp eagle in the region where I live. That's kind of something from the past now because the project is well known in the region I am and people are aware that harp eagles have an economic value. So yeah. this happens, it's very uncommon nowadays or, or in the system nowadays compared to what it was in the past. But that was the usual, the usual feeling. And it's more common to them to take livestock on small ranchers. 
And the small ranchers, as you know, are very, they have very little tolerance for, for predator destruction of livestock. Very, very little. The small ranchers are the one who actually kill stuff on prevention on, like it could eat something, so I will kill that. Yeah, yeah. They won't, yeah, they won't even risk that risk the no, actual thing no. happening. They'll they'll just try and try and stop it. It's interesting again, sort of linking it in with the with the Philippine eagle that I know they they still do have a lot of issues with people per shooting and, and trapping um, Philippine eagles, and part of that is because of deforestation. It's like a double edged sword that that the the, the villagers and, and people are encroaching on the eagles habitat and because they're cutting down the forest it's bringing the eagles closer to the edge and the eagles are hunting the the sort of periphery of, and and in in such a way they're then feeding on chickens and 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 livestock and and so on so do, do you you don't you obviously see that with the ran the small ranchers but it does it's it's nice to hear i suppose and hopefully for the philippine eagle that harp eagles have you, the, the knowledge behind harp eagles and, and has has moved on and hopefully the same will happen for philippine eagles as well yeah, so, yes, perhaps. one one thing that may be a big difference between the the philippine eagles and here i think i froze you're all right we've got you i'm back yeah you're back we still got you yeah okay uh one big difference is that here, the large ranchers forest. Are you hearing me? Yeah, uh, you keep, you're freezing a little bit, so we didn't get that bit. It's okay again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're back again. Uh, the thing is that on the larger ranchers in Brazil, you have the headquarters really far away from the forest. And normally you have no forest nearby, and that creates little opportunity to the harp eagles to, to go prey on livestock. Yeah. But with the small ranchers, they normally build the houses nearby the streams, like 60, 70 meters from the streams, so yeah. that they can ease the, the water collection from the for the for the houses and so on. And that creates opportunity to the harp eagle to prey on the livestock. But another trait that made it very, very different from the Philippines and even from Brazil itself is that the region of the arc of deforestation is occupied ethnically by people from southern Brazil, from migrants of southern Brazil, right? And these people don't eat monkeys, don't eat curacao, paper, tortoise. They are not forest people. Yeah. They raise cattle, they may eat a peccary because it looks like a pig, but they don't hunt like everything that passes be before they are the eyes. Yeah. And so there is no food competition, right? There is no one hunting, catching monkeys to make the, the, the eagles uh, food stressed to the point to be eating a lot of livestock. Just to give you an idea, on two cameras that I trapped, that I put on, on, on NAS, up to now, I never found any domestic livestock on it. Okay. I only recorded domestic livestock predation by interviews. And in less than 20% of the cases where we, we had an eagle being shot. Good. That's that, that's 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 positive. That's good to that's good to hear. Right. Okay. I am conscious of time because we've been on for a long time. So we've got to come to the the sort of the great work that you're doing. Obviously, we've talked about the nests that you're monitoring, your early days, and and the work with the Brazil nut um, harvesters, um, and a bit about the indigenous people, uh, tourism. That's it's because for you, it's all about making conservation work for 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 everyone really isn't it if, if i'm right so talk a little bit about the the tourism aspect then to finish up so the, the tourism came to my mind as a, a replica or a way to mirror what we have in the same state with the jaguars right we have a lot of jaguar tourism in the southern part of that same state in pantanal and 
on the last year, this bought like $7 million for the state. Wow. And that's a lot of money. And yeah. the Jaguars nowadays actually value a lot of money. Yeah. So people think twice before shooting one because it's killed a call or, or something like that. Yeah. And I try to replicate that here, but starting with the right suit and what I want to say with that, I was willing to have the, the property owner being benefited by it since the first day, right? So we have a, a, a share from each tourist coming that goes directly to the landowner, right? Yeah. And when we are working in small properties, we also hire the landowner to help us on every activity, on yeah. transport and tower building and trail cleaning. And we normally have the tourists on his house to make a snack, taste a, a, a local organic coffee and that kind of activity. Yeah. And they end up making like, if a guy, if a small landowner has a, a hard nest on his property, he can expect to increase his profit by, by 50%. Wow. It's a big difference. Yes, it's a lot of money for them. Yeah. And with the big landowners, it's kind of the same thing, but they will save money and do, do nothing. Like it. They, they don't need to be with us there. And we normally tell them they, they just give us the eagle and we give them money. Just yeah. don't spread a forest and we'll pay you a, a little something for having that forest there. Yeah, and they, and they support that as well. Yeah, yeah. And it, no, it works perfectly with both with both ends. So um, we have contracts with all people that have nests on their, their properties. We have contracts with them for doing so. You're, so essentially, to get because you're you're working alongside someone, if I believe right, reading the article, um, you're putting up towers um, near to in a, a safe distance from act, an active nest so that you're almost, based on your work, guaranteed to see a, a harpy eagle in, in the wild. Yeah, so we actually guarantee the, the scene based <coughs> on, on statistics. Remember the camera data I told you? Yeah. So I can essentially calculate how much someone needs to stay for seeing an adult. And we don't sell anything shorter than that. Yeah. And we sell that with a guarantee. Yeah. And we give the person 80% of the money back if he, he or she does not see the eagle. So right. people normally, when we say that we guarantee viewing of wildlife, people think, oh, you are doing a bad, bad thing. You're feeding the animals. You're doing some yeah. bullshit to, to guarantee that people will see them. But it's just the statistics. You just yeah. need to calculate the probability yeah. of seeing one, how, how many days does that take? And then you, you don't sell anything shorter than that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What, um, how, how, obviously, because every pair of eagles is, is different in, in the way that they behave and respond to, to things in their environment. So how have you found that the platforms, these towers that are up to 90 feet, is that right? Um, yes. Tall? How have you had any problems with eagles? You know, not not tolerating it or no. You may remember that the the my starting point is that the nut harvesters go to those nests. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they usually are not hunters. Yeah. So the thing is that the eagles have been incidentally habituated to people. People by visited. Them. Yeah, yeah. Because they, they get visitors periodically yeah. and they grow up in an environment that there is people collecting collecting nuts all the time. So they usually don't care anything about us. We have in 30 nests, we have two pairs that don't like people very much. Yeah. And both cases are cases where you had in a logging site, you have a, a tree being felled that touched the nest tree, the Brazil nut tree, yeah. during the nesting process. Okay. And those eagles hate people. And obviously we don't work in those yeah. specific places with tourism. 
unless you are in a situation where the chick is very small and the, the adult will tolerate you no matter what. But normally we don't work on, on two places. Right. So how how is it going then? How obviously how 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 long have you been running the, the sort of tourism aspect for uh, during three years? Yeah. We have had tourism here. And we just broke even on the last year. So all the investment done was paid off. Yeah. And we had liquid profit for the first time in three years. Oh, now yeah. it's just to, to keep going and increase the, the number of visits, essentially, and consequently yeah. the number of masks. Yeah. The year obviously will not happen because of the pandemics. Yeah. But we may have a, a longer, long tailored tourism season because yeah. by the end of the year, we may have things getting back to normal and having visits on the on the Amazon forest again. Yeah. So yeah. the plan from now on is just to, to keep increasing it. Yeah. And I mean, having more tourists and more nests. Yeah, brilliant. And, and in turn, obviously that, that benefits harpy eagles and harpy eagle conservation and then trickles down and, and all, yeah, as we've already discussed, has a, has a big yes. impact on, on it. This, this allow the people from the Amazon to own and drive conservation not to be told by someone else in a developed country what they should be doing, right? Yeah. It's a way of generating concrete value from it. Not yeah. saying stuff that the, the forest is cool and it's important and climate change and so on. It's just a way to, to offer something very concrete and very immediate for the people. Yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons why, again, I fell in love with the work in the Philippines with the Philippine Eagle Foundation because they're essentially empowering the the locals, the indigenous people to protect the forest, to look after the forest, to 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 work alongside the eagles because that's the only way you're going to conserve these places is by empowering these people who live alongside them. Not like exactly not like someone like me sat in the UK dictating to to well, another country. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, making a process against yeah, exactly. the Yeah, exactly. Right, Everton, I won't keep you any longer because you've been the longest one we've done yet. We've been on for like <laughs> nearly, well, well over an hour anyway. I could sit here all night and talk to you about um, about Harpy Eagles and I'm definitely going to be coming out and visiting. I'm sure of that anyway. Um, but I'll probably watch you go up the tree. <laughs> <laughs> I can let um, you climb yeah um but yeah thank you very much for taking the time to chat to us i will i'll put a link up to the national geographic thing and if you've got any other websites or anything you want to share um I, let me know i'll put it i up don't there. have a website but in case someone is interested in coming here to see the eagles someone who is interested in in wildlife photography and tourism you can visit southwide.com that is the tourism company website and you can book a trip with them and i have a, a little instagram page if anyone is interested in seeing heart eagle photos from time to time yeah. uh, we, i post uh camera trap photo there so you can find me on instagram and that's it i think thank you so much for for inviting me it's nice to have the word around no, it's a it's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, right, I'll I'll put that on. I'll put South Wild on on as well. I'll share that, and I'll I'll fi I'll find you on Instagram, and I'll share that with people so they can uh, they can have it. Right, I'll end the live stream now. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We've got um, we're in India on Tuesday. We're talking about black kites and in India. Right, cheers. <laughs>